Hello everyone and welcome to part two of our lecture on chapter 14, the assessment of interpersonal relationships. In part one of our lecture, we really talked about some of the formal assessments of couples and families as well as some best practices in the inventories and assessments of intimate partner violence. In part two of our lecture here, we're going to talk about some of the assessments that can be used for assessments of child abuse, as well as the utilization of genograms in the work that we do with clients, and then some general interpersonal assessments that can be helpful in the work that we do with clients. So let's jump right in by talking about the assessments of child abuse. Similar to IPV, there are three major types of child abuse physical, emotional, and sexual. And there's also an additional category for the neglect, which also is measured by a lot of assessments of child abuse, though I will say that it's not measured as well as we need it to be. And right now, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2010, which was when they published a pretty updated um, account of calls, they received 3.3 million referrals for individual, for referrals for maltreatment of 5.9 million children. And of those unique cases, so the cases where there was only one singular type of abuse that was being perpetuated, 78% of them related to neglect, 17.6% related to physical abuse, and 9.2% related to sexual abuse. The majority of abusers in these referrals were parents with 81.2% and 84.2% of those involved biological parents. For unique cases, those that were involving abuse from one gender, it was pretty split as the gender of, perpetu of um, perpetrators being male and female was slightly more female perpetrators than male. And the victimization rates by children's gender were approximately equal, as well as the victimization rates by child's race and, race and ethnicity <clears throat> for three groups were reported as 44% white, 20, almost 22% African American, and 21% Latin, Latinx. However, African American, Native American, and multiracial populations had the highest rates per 1,000 children at 14%, 11%, and 12% respectively. So you can see that this is a really widespread problem and something that is likely to show up in the work that we do if we're doing work with individuals who are children at the time that they're coming in or who are recently um, coming out of childhood. So there are some guidelines that we can follow for assessing child abuse in the work that we're doing. And these are the best sort of effective practices for conducting child abuse and maltreatment assessments. And the first of those is that counselors need to be aware of the current abuse literature, including common symptoms, as well as legal and ethical considerations for child abuse and what that means. Clients also or counselors also need to assess any mediating factors in addition to the common symptoms to intentionally assess abuse as an experience versus a diagnosis. So some common correlates of correlates of abuse may include things like depression and suicidality, anger, aggression, cognitive distortions, risk-taking behaviors, and difficult interpersonal relationships. And some common mediating factors may include things like age of onset, duration and intensity, and frequency, guilt and feelings of powerlessness, duration that abuse remained a secret, to whom the client survivor has disclosed the abuse, ongoing support, pre-abuse relationships with significant others and parents, as well as client resiliency. So it's our responsibility as eth ethical con consumers and clinicians to make sure that we are assessing for both these common symptoms and these mediating factors. The third guideline refers to take an ecological approach to assessment, which involves significant others in the individual's life as appropriate, and the assessment of functioning and relationships both before and after the abuse. So looking at who are the important people in our clients' lives, do we need to assess them? Is it safe for us to do that? And how those relationships change from before to after the abuse. And finally, counselors should carefully select any instruments with sound psychometric properties as relevant when they are wanting to assess for child abuse and 
you want to make sure that you're using assessment tools effectively and using multiple assessment tools with clients. Table 14.2 in our book includes an entire list of child abuse assessment tools. I will say that these particular assessment tools are going to be helpful as screeners in general work that we do. And unless your population or your sort of clin your clinic that you're working in is specialized in these areas, you likely won't have a lot of experience with these assessments, which is why I really want you to focus on the general practices and guidelines for conducting an ethical and most effective child abuse assessment. And one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about is genograms. And a genogram is a graphic representation of a family system and the interactions within the system. And this particular sort of term is based on Bowen's family system theory, which is an entire field of family therapy. And it's its own modality, Bowen's system, and that really helps to sort of formalize and narrow the work that we do within families. So when you're doing a genogram, it's a way to graphically represent every member of the family, how they interact with one another, what their relationships are to one another, and what that means in the context of our clients presenting concerns. And it's always recommended that a client constructs a genogram with three generations so that we as clinicians can best identify patterns within the family. And it's also important if you're using genograms in the work that you're doing, that you define family very broadly to include members that have played a major role in the family life for the client. This might include natural born family members, but this can also include chosen family members and even friends. It's really needing to broaden that out because that's gonna give us the most comprehensive view of our client. And a genogram is often constructed as a collaborative task between the client and the clinician. So oftentimes genograms take quite a bit of time and you're collaborating multiple times with the client to construct it. So keep that in mind if you're going to use this as a tool with your clients. And overall, developing a genogram is compared to casting a wider and wider net to capture information regarding family relationships and dynamics. Genograms can show the successes and challenges in families across multiple generations, as well as major events and relationships among members, as well as the quality of those relationships. Sometimes as well, one tool that can be helpful in the work that you're doing is doing a genogram on very specific things. So some genograms can be very broad and say like, I want to just know everything about you and someone might do it in an intake. But you can also do a genogram that says, okay, you're coming in with anxiety. Talk to me through like what anxiety look like for your parents, for your grandparents, for your cousins, for your aunts and uncles, for your friends or these other important people in your life. And you can construct a genogram on the presenting concern to look for patterns and identify sort of this comprehensive view of what anxiety looks like in that person's life and within the systems in which they operate. There are some common symbols that are used in genograms. Our book goes into a breakdown of these as well in figure 14.1. And I have them up here just so that you can see them as well. It really sort of depends on your preference. You can adapt a genogram to what you want. As you can see, because there are so many options, this is only half of them. There's an, another entire section here. Because there are so many options of what you can include in a genogram, sometimes it's helpful to use software programs that will develop the genogram for you. And it just sort of is trial and error of you exploring what's out there. These can be really helpful in exploring what your client is coming in with if their interpersonal relationships are of primary concern in the work that you're doing with them as a clinician. And the last thing that I want to talk to you all about is some additional measures of interpersonal assessment because a lot of times assessments of interpersonal functioning tend to be really focused on members of a couple or of a family, implying that you have to be within one of these relationships in order to be assessed. And that isn't always truly the case. In fact, we have an entire list of interpersonal assessments that can be used to measure one's own interpersonal style and how we as individuals navigate to interpersonal behaviors that are present in all interpersonal interactions. And those two interpersonal behaviors are control, which we sometimes think of as dominance versus submission, 
and affiliation, which is oftentimes described as friendliness and hostility. So these assessments all sort of are available to us as clinicians to be able to navigate someone's interpersonal style regardless of if they're in a relationship or they have a family or anything like that. So a couple of them that show up in our book, I'm just going to throw all of them up there for you, are the checklist of interpersonal transactions, the checklist of psychotherapy transactions, the interpersonal compass, the impact message inventory, the interpersonal adjective scales, and the Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument. And again, all of these assessments are often used as interventions for clients in their interpersonal reactions if that is their primary concern in therapy. So you might have a client that comes in and says, yep, I'm really struggling to get along with my peers at work or I'm really struggling in school because I don't have a lot of friends or I just am really struggling with my neighbor next door and that's their primary concern. And you might use these assessments and inventories as an intervention in the work that you're doing with the client saying like okay let's see if we can put some words to this if we can quantify what this means for you and so you'll pull out one of these assessments to be able to do that so that is where we are going to wrap up our lecture on chapter 14 as always here are the review questions to help you study and make sure that you're covering the important concepts from this chapter and i will see you all in the next lecture